Good morning. My name is David from 52 Churches in 52 Weeks. A few months ago, I made some trips out to Utah to get a crash course on everything Latter-day Saints. From exploring various historic LDS ward chapels to some temple open houses, and also various sites that paid tribute to the men and women who pioneered out west, out into the wild unknown, all due to the religious convictions. It was quite humbling to learn more about this piece of American history because it's really this American exodus story that you don't hear a whole lot about, especially from my background from a Protestant perspective. Well, after exploring the Temple Square area, a few blocks away, I came across this towering, majestic Roman Catholic cathedral called the Cathedral of the Madeline. Before I visited, I had seen a few pictures of this online, and it really caught my eye just due to the blend of different architectural styles outside. But inside, it was very colorful, very vibrant, with this Spanish Gothic look inside. So as a lifelong Protestant who is very curious about attending different type of churches and understanding more about that, there was like a number of questions popped in my head because with Salt Lake City and how the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has really shaped and influenced the history and the development of Salt Lake City in Utah, the three questions that really popped in my head with this Cathedral of the Madeline was number one, how does a Catholic church operate in Salt Lake City when it's the minority? Because typically in many cities and many towns, like usually the Roman Catholic Church is usually the majority. So what does it do in Salt Lake City where it, it's essentially inside the Vatican of Mormonism, if that makes sense? Number two was how does, what is the history of this church, especially when it comes to the location of it, because it's just under the shadow, essentially, of the iconic Salt Lake Temple, just being blocks away from Temple Square. Because Latter-day Saints, from what I've learned now, like they faced so much persecution to even get to Utah to accept another church just on the outskirts of the city. What's the history? Tell me more about that. And then number three, is how does the current, how does the history and the current dynamic work with the relationship between Catholics and Latter-day Saints in the past and in today? So before I had to fly back, I got the chance to walk inside, look around, and got to witness a five o'clock evening Vespers service. So I'll share a little bit more about the history of the Cathedral of the Madeline. I got uh, my little walking tour guide here. And I also want to share a little bit about how it has worked with the various Latter-day Saint presidents and prophets in the past and how this even got to where it is today. So I'll share a little bit about what it looked like and sounded like inside. I'll be back in just a moment.
I could listen to that all day. While researching uh, the relationship between Latter-day Saints and Catholics, uh, I dug into quite a bit of history on this, and uh, two historians really popped out that I just want to give uh, proper uh, citations to. Uh, one is Gary Topping. Uh, he's a Utah historian and the archivist for the Cathedral of the Madeline, and also Gregory Prince. Uh, he wrote a book called David O. McKay and the Rise of Modern Mormonism. Uh, I'm going to put uh, some of their book links in the description box below if you want to research more into this. Because after researching this, uh, first off, the summer of 1844 was a banner time period when it came to severe religious persecution in the United States. And after learning more about this, I can't help but feel that the early Latter-day Saints developed a, a type of kinship to other persecuted religious groups, especially with Catholics. Because in June 1844, Joseph Smith, the prophet, the seer, the revelator, the founder of the Church of the Latter-day Saint movement, discovered the Book of Mormon, he was killed and martyred by this anti-Mormon mob. But what many people, and what has seemed to have been lost and scrubbed out of history, is what was going on at that same time in Philadelphia, because days later, uh, less than two weeks in Philadelphia uh, culminated with the Bible riots. What are the Bible riots? Well, what was happening is you had these nativist groups, these people that had been living in Philadelphia for a very long time, many of whom were Protestants, and they started to see an influx of Irish Catholics coming into their city. So this created a lot of tension. And in May of 1844, you had this, this uh, really this miscommunication that happened between a teacher and this director of the school who was Catholic. And there was some letters exchanged due to an unruly classroom. And the director, again, who was Catholic, had mentioned something to the effect of maybe removing the, the Bible to deal with this classroom. These letters got out. It created an, an uproar that Catholics were trying to remove the Protestant Bible from this public schools. So as a result, these riots broke out. Two of the 13 Catholic churches were burned to the ground and just created and, and swelled up even further tension. So then fast forward, you know, a week or so after Joseph Smith was killed in Philadelphia, this nativist group were going to be doing a march. And from what I understand, a Catholic father had gotten wind that this group may be attacking their Catholic church. So to defend himself, he brought in this arsenal of weapons. But the problem was some, some of the muskets were defective. So he returned the muskets to the manufacturer, but again, someone got wind of this, kind of, you know, whispered into someone else's ear, hey, the Catholics are going to be, you know, shooting at us during this parade. We got to do something. And as a result, you have this, this big uproar where I guess even some cannons were fired into this Catholic church, resulting in several deaths. I understand about 50 people were, were injured and just, again, this was just an absolute mess. So after hearing about this, again, this is where I feel like there was some type of kinship between Latter-day Saints and especially Irish Catholics. So fast forward to you know, the 1860s, you had Brigham Young kind of basically ruling and engineering all of Utah. And there were not many Catholics in Utah. Well, you had a few um, missionaries, a few fathers that had ventured in. And at that time, from what I understand, there was less than 10 Catholics in Salt Lake City. And you had this father, Edward Kelly, who arrived. And he was speaking with a family, and apparently they were trying to set up a school, so this Catholic family sold him their land. So he bought the land, was going to start building, but apparently there was an issue with the title that had been owned by a previous Latter-day Saint. So Father Edward Kelly decided, you know, with this contestant, that they should bring it before Brigham Young, 
to figure out the title and then just abide by whatever Brigham Young would say. So there's a little debate how exactly this happened because it does look like there was the court did get involved somehow. Other people are saying it was just brought to Brigham Young. So again, this is where it's a little confusing. But from what I understand, they gave it to the father, they gave it to the Catholic Church. And from what another historian that I read, Brigham Young actually donated $500 to start up a Catholic school. So this is where, with the Cathedral of the Madeline as it stands right now, this is why it's just a few blocks away from Temple Square. One of the strange coincidences I found from the Bible riots that targeted Irish Catholics was there was a newborn Irish baby named Lawrence Scanlon, who decades later almost single-handedly changed the outlook of Catholicism in Utah to this very day. So by the age of 28, he found himself as a devout Catholic missionary who had to serve the needs of all Catholics in what is today Utah. So he had 800 Catholics, one parish, and essentially he had to create all these schools and churches as he went. But the biggest thing that happened is he developed a cordial relationship with Latter-day Saints and really was kind of the first example of how interfaith dialogue can work to everyone's benefit. Latter-day Saint Apostle, I want to say Erasmus Snow, invited Father Scanlon to hold a Latin Mass in the St. George Tabernacle. I, I guess even the Tabernacle Choir uh, helped perform some of the Latin Mass songs for this. And the big thing that really enhanced Scanlon's standing in Utah was even though he denounced polygamy, uh, President Grover Cleveland was looking to create a petition that would put restrictions on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and Scanlon refused to sign it, and he even criticized the private lives of LDS critics because he found so much value from the LDS members that he knew. Well, eventually Scanlon found himself going up to Salt Lake City, and with that, that plot of land that Father Edward Kelly had developed and created a, a church with a St. Mary Magdalene church. The Irish Catholics in the area, they had outgrown the area. And the plan was to build up the Cathedral of the Madeline as it stands today to essentially become the mothership of the Catholic Church in Utah. So they broke ground. And from my understanding, they completed the project in about nine to ten years. Absolutely fascinating how fast that they were able to build this cathedral. So the cathedral was consecrated in 1909. And from my understanding is, it, one, one thing that I read is it's named after St. Mary Magdalene. And it's one of two Catholic churches in the world that, that is named after Mary Magdalene. So why? So my understanding is the thought process, and this is not confirmed, but, the, but what Gary Topping, the historian, thought is because Pioneer Day is on July 24th that commemorates the Latter-day Saint pioneers that got to Utah, well, in Catholicism, Mary Magdalene Day is July 22nd. So they're thinking that for Catholics with Mary Magdalene, this as Pioneer Day was going on for Latter-day Saints, Catholics would have something to celebrate with Mary Magdalene. After Bishop Scanlon, the cathedral's interior and beautification rested upon the shoulders of its second bishop, Joseph S. Glass. This man was one of refined taste. So he hired a famed architect of the time, and he was heavily inspired by the Spanish Gothic era of the Middle Ages. So inside, when you walk in, uh, you see this, this huge mural. And I'll, I'll put some images so you can get a better look in the corner here. But in this, you have this just vibrant image of Jesus Christ on the cross. And right above him is God the Father and the Holy Spirit. But on the very bottom is a pelican. So in the Middle Ages, apparently a pelican was symbolic uh, it, where it would feed its own blood to its young. So um, obviously this seems like some type of symbolism of Jesus Christ uh, shedding his blood for us, for our sins. So then to the left of the Trinity, 
uh, you have several images of Old Testament figures, including Adam and Eve, Moses, David, and so on. And then on the other side, you have several Catholic saints that include John the Baptist and Joan of Arc. But probably the most controversial is the Bible passages that Glass ordered to have painted in the cathedral. And the most prominent one that gets some of the most eye-raising is from Galatians 1.8. So it reads, though we an angel from heaven preach a gospel to you besides that which we have preached to you, let him be an anathema. So a central Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints doctrine is that, that Joseph Smith, he was visited by an angel Moroni that helped him find the gold plates that led to the Book of Mormon. And with this particular Bible passage, and even when I was visiting this, they had this image of a golden angel right underneath this passage. So obviously, and then within the Catholic Church and Latter-day Saints, Latter-day Saints believe that there was a great apostasy that, you know, the church kind of, with the Catholic Church especially, kind of went its own way. And this is where the, the selection of these Bible verses are, are just very direct and from some other commentary that I had read, is it wasn't an attack on Latter-day Saints. It was more of a defense of the Catholic faith and how it is different from its Latter-day Saint neighbors. With the Bible passages that were selected in the cathedral, you think that would create some tension between Catholics and Latter-day Saints. But one of the curveballs in the relationship came from a letter that Gary Topping discovered in from 1923. So this is wild. So there was a doctor, his name was uh, Ira Humphrey, and he was writing to a friend that basically apologized uh, from a previous letter with, I, I guess something was, was written wrong, and he blamed it on a poker game that he had returned from at 3 a.m., and here was who was part of the poker game. It was the President Prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, Heber Grant. It also included the Bishop Joseph S. Glass from the Cathedral of the Madeline, and also uh, the Reverend, I want to say his name was Elmer Gorshin, from the First Protestant Church in Salt Lake City, which was a first congregational church. And I guess a lawyer was there too. Not sure how that all worked. So, it's like a lot of people, when they found out about this, is like, why would the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints play poker? Like, I, many people just can't imagine him with a pair of aces in his hand or so, much less with the company that were there. Maybe, you know, with the, the social elite at that time, maybe there was something there. Who knows? But when you think of poker, you're thinking cigars, you're thinking, you know, alcohol. Obviously, with the word of wisdom, Heber Grant would never be a part of that. So some people think it's real. Other people think it was just this, this doctor who was just joking, making up some type of crazy story to just make fun or just have some fun with his friend. So who knows? But between the 1920s and the 1930s, uh, relations between Latter-day Saints and Catholics were, were pretty quiet. But it wasn't until the 1950s where things kind of blew up a little bit. Because there was the new bishop, Dwayne Hunt. And I guess uh, another Catholic priest had written an editorial that kind of attacked Latter-day Saints. And as a result, that didn't go well. Uh, bishop Dwayne Hunt then... I guess, went on a KSL radio station to talk a little bit about the Catholic faith. And then he got attacked by the Latter-day Saint host from that. And it just created this tension. Not only that, but Latter-day, like, with... Not only that, but Catholics at that time were discouraged to go to weddings or events of other faiths. So at that time, Catholics were just very distant from anyone else. But then by 1958, uh, there was a general authority named Bruce McConkie, and he was writing a piece 
And it was such a direct attack at the Catholic Church because it essentially called the Catholic Church uh, the Church of the Devil. And Bishop Hunt actually went to a Latter-day Saint uh, politician to uh, in tears about this letter. And I guess even Bishop Hunt went to President David O. McKay to voice his disappointment with this letter. So pr President McKay um, he kind of took some responsibility from what it sounds like and softened and removed the tension. So eventually Bishop Hunt um, suddenly died in 1960 and President McKay went to the Cathedral of the Madeline and sat for that funeral. And then a decade later, when President McKay passed away, the then Bishop of the Cathedral of the Madeline made sure and ordered that the bells be tolled when the hearse of President McKay was driving by the cathedral to go to the cemetery. So my understanding from last 20, 30 years, relationships between Latter-day Saints and Catholics have been very, very good. Uh, I guess uh, the last uh, apostle from the Quorum of Twelve Apostles to record some discussion about that, those relations was uh, Elder M. Russell Ballard. And he kind of talked about the Cathedral of the Madeline being this beacon, being this architectural gem. And even with some of the Latter-day Saint friends that I have on Facebook, I've, I've seen a few who have actually gone and attended the Cathedral of the Madeline during Christmas to see some of their services. So overall, it seems like the relations are just really, really well at this time. That's going to wrap up this video. Hope you enjoyed this historical look into the Cathedral of the Madeline and the relationship between Catholics and Latter-day Saints. I'll have a few more videos coming up from my visit from Utah, so make sure to stay tuned for those. But until next time, hope you have a good one.